Um, please do bring up the, uh, the chairs for the first panel. Um, we have a, uh, a wonderful discussion coming up, moderated by Jacob Hook. Jacob is the managing, managing partner for Oliver Wyman in uh, Asia Pacific. Um, he's going to be joined by um, two of the uh, very interesting and potentially differently opinionated um, panel members, uh, Naveen from JP Morgan and Larissa from the Oliver Wyman Forum um, Think Tank. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the future of money um, and how those different flavours of money interact and how they get there in the future. Um, so with that, can I ask you all to welcome Jacob and the panel to the stage? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this fireside chat on the future of money. In particular, we're going to be talking about the concept of tokenized money. So we've had a little bit of discussion already this afternoon about tokenized assets, and we're going to really dig into what the concept of tokenization means when we think about money. There's been an awful lot of speculation over the last five years or so, about how the future of money might change, how technology, particularly how blockchain technology, might overhaul the way in which money works in our financial system. However, despite there being a lot of talk, there being a lot of experiments, um, there hasn't yet been a lot of consensus as to what's going to emerge and what it will all look like. So around the world, central banks have been experimenting with uh, CBDCs, We've had many major financial institutions running different experiments with uh, new stable coins and other forms of tokenized money. It's all starting to come together, but it's not yet clear what it's going to look like for us in the, in the future. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I've got two wonderful uh, discussants here for this, this chat. First, Naveen Malala, who is JP Morgan's uh, global head of coin systems at Onyx by JP Morgan, based here in Singapore. Naveen has been a uh, very involved member of the digital money community. He tells me he's been involved since Bitcoin was at $200. Which even before. <laughs> even before. So that, that's his personal timeline there. Uh, Naveen was um, playing a major role in both the launch of JPM coin and also very involved in Singapore's Project Guardian, which we'll hear a little bit more on the stage uh, later on today. And um, next to me, I have Larissa De Lima, who is a senior fellow at the Oliver Wyman Forum in New York. Larissa leads Oliver Wyman's Future of Money program. She's very involved in research around digital money and what it's going to look like in the future. She spent a decade or so consulting to financial institutions, public sector agencies, and other clients of Oliver Wyman's in the intersection between technology and, and policy. So. We're going to start with Larissa and really start at the top of this, this subject and really ask, what do we mean by tokenized money? What, what is this actually and, and what are the different kinds of tokenized money out there vying for dominance at the moment? All right, so tokenized money is the next generation of money, from physical money to electronic money. And what is special about tokenized money and DLT technology is that it allows the combination of transfer of value and the book of records. Why does this matter? So today, we rely on a vast network of intermediaries to provide us with the trust of who owns what. With DLT, that trust transfers to the network that allows and establishes that book of record in combination with the transfer of value. So this enables money to move from being bilateral to potentially being multilateral. And we're still at the very beginnings of understanding what the implications may be and what forms money may take as a result. So we've seen stable coins take off in crypto markets. They have proven scale. And the regulatory landscape defining them is progressing and evolving. We're also seeing the emergence of tokenized money market funds. And what's interesting about this construct is money market funds, they compete 
with deposits as a store of value, but when they're tokenized, they can also compete as a means of exchange. So now you have asset managers potentially competing with banks and providing liquidity services. And of course, banks aren't behind. They're also thinking through how they adapt to tokenization and what type of products that they offer through tokenized deposits or more. Thanks, Rosa. So, Naveen, do you want to expand on, on those different flavors of tokenized money a bit? And in particular, tell us about like, why we should care. What, what's, what's the real benefits here? Yeah, I mean, just to pick up from Larissa's point, I don't think banks are adapting so much as banks are leading, especially when we talk about um, tokenization. Um, so if we think about going back to my journey, right, leading JPM coin. So when we launched it in 2020, the discussion was all about CBDCs. The discussion was all about stable coins. Nobody spoke about commercial bank money. So we spent the last two, three years making the case for commercial bank money being a dominant and foundational aspect of digital currencies going forward. I think people get it right now. So you have other banks, you know, following up with tokenized form of money, with commercial bank money coming to the fore. But there's still a lot to be done in terms of clearing the air in terms of what tokenization really is. These days I spend a lot of time talking to people about the fundamental difference between tokenization of assets and tokenization of liabilities. Two different things. And why do I say it's two different things? Because when it comes to liabilities, typically the issuer of liabilities and the issuer of tokens are one and the same, mm -hmm. which is not usually the case for assets. So that is why terminology is important. We really don't like the word tokenized deposits. We like to call it as deposits on chain or deposit tokens, but, but that's a, 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 a subtle point uh, which I'd like to make. The third thing is, well, why bother with it, right? Mm -hmm. What are the problems that you're looking to solve? Like with assets, the case which is usually made is that fractionalization, improving access, improving liquidity to traditional illiquid asset classes. What about money? For money, it is all about bringing in programmability, composability, and more than buzzwords, right? Like if you think about banking sector, like what sort of programmability can you do beyond a standing order? Very little. So how do we get bank accounts to the next level in terms of things that you can do with it, in terms of being able to implement conditionality, implement composability. So those are all the things that we've been doing with commercial bank money. And then you bring in multi-asset ledgers with tokenized cash and tokenized assets on a single ledger. It opens up a whole new world of possibilities. Thank you. And just to make that maybe a little more concrete, I understand that um, JP Morgan, JPM coin has um, recently released additional functionality around programmable payments. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that actually is? And and that is something that we are most excited about. Again, there was all, all this notion that programmability, to, to get to programmability, you needed stable coins or you needed crypto. Not really. I mean, you could very well do that with fiat currencies. And what we are most excited about, not just doing a POC or a pilot, but making it generally available to our institutional clients, is you could go into your portal. You could go into JP Morgan portal and set rules on your bank account. If certain events happens, then do this. Or or build in, build in conditions and capabilities which are simply not possible with bank accounts today. Thank you. So with all these different types of tokenized money out there, Larissa, if I can ask you, can you tell us a little bit, what do you think will drive what forms of tokenized money win and, and, and what don't prosper? Yeah, so I think there's three main drivers, commercialization, technology, and policy. And I actually want to focus on the policy side. So when I was talking about these different forms of money, we're talking about the change of, from trust in intermediaries to trust in network. But there's a different type of trust that's really critical that exists uh, today in the system, and that's provided by the central banks, which is trust in the stability of value. That remains critical, especially when you see more and more proliferation of different types of private money. And now we're seeing the discussion around how does the central bank provide that stability, becoming more nuanced and including more variables. So there's, of course, central bank digital currencies, lots and lots of discussion at this, at this festival around those options. We're also seeing come to the table reserve back tokens. So that's a way of the central bank focusing on the anchoring while the private sector focuses on the distribution. And with that question around the private sector distributing money, it opens up this consideration around who should have access 
to reserves? Who, what types of institutions should be allowed to central bank access? And of course, central bank access is a privilege. And with that privilege comes requirements. And with, you consider the vast um, requirements from capital and liquidity perspective, that will also have an impact on the commercial viability of different models of private money. And lastly, policy will also be critical to enabling the pace of change about how quickly central banks are able to tokenize reserves and settle on these questions, as well as how quickly and what choices are made around tokenizing government securities. Um, because of course that can help drive liquidity and tokenization as well as establish a new use case for digital money. Thank you. So Naveen, Larissa has emphasized a lot the role of central banks and governments and policy, but you talked earlier about commercial banks leading the way in the space and really driving things forward. What do you think of the role of, of banks in all of this? Again, um, foundational. Um, and the reason I say that is money today, the dominant form of money today is not central bank money, but commercial bank money. 90% of the money is commercial bank money. 90% of the payments which are done today is based on commercial bank money. Is that going to change in the world of digital currencies? We don't think so. We think that the, the structure of money in terms of central bank money, commercial bank money, e-money, which exists today, is probably going to morph into CBDCs, into um, commercial bank version of digital currencies, whether that is deposit tokens or like, and stable coins. So we see that market structure going, like not fundamentally shifting. So what that means is that commercial banks have a dominant role to play. We don't think central bank money is going to crowd out commercial bank money. So if you believe in this thesis, that you will believe by extension that commercial bank money will lead the way in terms of introducing digital currencies for the future. All right. Uh, how about wallets, though? What, what would the role of wallets be in all of that, and, and which parties will be owning those wallets? Again, so, well, like in all of the discussions in digital currencies, what is missed out is ledgers, right? Like, so the world of today, you have every bank maintaining their own ledgers. And within a bank as well, some of my colleagues will tell you there is no one ledger, right? There are, there are separate ledgers for assets, there are separate ledgers for money. And even for money, there's no one ledger. There are many different ledgers. So we believe in the financial architecture of the future moving towards shared ledgers. So you will have this notion of shared infrastructure where banks will start putting their liabilities on not on their books, but shared books. So if you believe in the notion of shared ledgers, then by extension again is that who provides access to the shared ledgers? So we think that there will be a world of wallets tied to user identities which can hold multiple banks' liabilities in multiple assets. And banks will then have to start differentiating themselves not on the tech stats that they provide, but by the quality of their balance sheet, but the credit quality by the value-added services that they provide. I think, Naveen, what you're painting as a vision there is central banks playing a role fairly similar to the role they play today, commercial banks doing, doing the same, a new layer on the wallet side, which could have a variety of different players participating. All of this enabled with new technology, shared ledgers and, and the like, but no real fundamental shift to market structure, I think is what I'm hearing. Yeah, and again, right, like for, if you say that, if you flip the argument and say, but what makes you believe that? What are the alternate possibilities? The alternate possibilities where CBDCs become a dominant form of money and if they start crowding out commercial bank money, like what does that do to credit creation? What does that do to KYC and onboarding? What does that do to client service? So all of those questions remain unanswered. There is a very good reason why we have a two-tier financial architecture today, which works. We don't think that that's going to change in a hurry. I know, Larissa, you've done a lot of thinking about alternative possible futures in this space. Could you tell us a bit more about what you think? Yeah, so I, th I do think that it's important to consider alternatives to banks being dominant. Um, so. My team has been conducting interviews with over 80 stakeholders, doing roundtables, and we're painting the picture of what are potential alternative, feasible versions of how the financial system could be refunded. Um, we have put out a few series of works. One is meant to be more educational. It's a choose-your-own-adventure novel. We encourage people to play um, and check it out in our booth. Um, we're also launching a report today that is more technical and considers the potential impact on wholesale banking. Now, 
to provide a bit of the intuition for why an alternative to bank-driven system could emerge. So instead of thinking of DLT as revolutionary, think of it as an accelerant of existing trends that are already impacting banking. On the one hand, increased competition to deposits. You see that with new forms of money. Second, non-bank financial intermediation, which will only be made easier because ledgers facilitate more multilateral market-based uh, systems. And then third, technology taking over capital as a source of competitive advantage. Again, only those who are really, really at the leading edge of technology will be the ones to best adapt. So what this means is, of course, there is a scenario where banks win. Alternatively, you may see new types of digital intermediaries with the tech capabilities being the ones that are providing the wallets that Naveen brought out. Third, there's a possibility of universal networks taking off, and that could be an even more extreme version of tech enablement, perhaps a Web3 vision. And I do think that we should also consider the scenario where there is a change in that balance between pri private and public money, and it may come intentionally or perhaps unintentionally because there's changes from the public mandate of the central bank or because of crisis. And that's likely what has motivated many changes in the financial system in the past. Thanks, Larissa. We've got a very mixed audience today of entrepreneurs, bankers, policymakers, others, from these different standpoints, uh, how do you think market particip participants should be thinking about these scenarios? Like, given the uncertainty, what should we be doing today? So there's, there's a phrase that the future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. So I think there's a lot to learn from the various experiments that we'll be listening to today um, and understand what are the implications and thinking through what does this change in terms of market structure to think through what does this change in terms of my strategic positioning. Thank you. And Naveen, do you want to respond at all to those, those visions, those scenarios that are a little bit different from some of your expectations? I would, to what Larissa had said, I don't discount any of those possibilities, but to borrow her phrase, I would see that more as an evolution. I would not think that any of those will fundamentally result in a tectonic shift in terms of market structure. I don't see commercial banks as the primary provider of liabilities disappearing in a hurry. Thank you. So maybe to, to wrap things up and just, just come back to our original question, right? Remember, we're, we're asking today, are we serious about tokenized money yet? Is there an emerging consensus? Is, is, is the industry really changing? So I'll start with you, Naveen, just really quick view. How close are we to the future and what's going to get us there? We've, we've begun the process in terms of going to the future and in a way we are worse off today than what we are because if you look at money in general, now banks have started introducing their own tokens. We have JPM coin, other banks have started introducing their own version of deposits on chain, but you lack fungibility. So how do you create the singleness of money? Where are CBDCs? So till the point central bank digital currencies come into being and bring about the fungibility, we are actually back to the era of private bank money where things were not trading at par. So we've just begun on the journey and in the next five years we will start seeing meaningful steps being taken towards this two-tier monetary system but created all on digital currencies. So policy makers being the really decisive factor there and, and the, the finalization of the, of the path and model for CBDCs being what you're looking for. And moving beyond experiments to actually introduction of central bank digital currencies. Right. Thank you. Larissa. Yeah, I think it's driving the use cases, learning from the experiments, and I think the evolution will seem slow until there's the hockey stick and big changes. Okay, sounds like we're getting serious about digital money and tokenization then. So I'd like to say thank you very much to my panelists, Naveen and Larissa.